Okay, let's get started. So next up is Carl Schultz from Intel. He flew in from the US just for this talk, I think. Do you know back tomorrow or? Yeah, that is tomorrow. Okay. So he's going to talk about OpenHPC, a new community effort for HPC. Thank you. So, hello everybody. So I'm going to be talking about OpenHPC, and I'm going to start off with a quick overview of, of the talk. So I'll give you a little bit of background and motivation for the effort, um, who's sort of involved, and then talk about uh, the components that are actually uh, involved and included in OpenHPC. And then, as this is a nice technical community, I want to sort of peel the onion a little bit and talk about the development infrastructure and what, you know, what we're using and how we're building all of these packages. Uh, and I'll talk also about integration testing and finally end up with some participation options and future timeline. So, motivation for this community. This is a, a new community. It actually went live um, at the end of last year in November at the big conference in the US, which is a big supercomputing conference. Um, and ultimately, the reason to sort of try to, to start a community like this is because Many of the sites uh, around the world spend a lot of time integrating a lot of open source software or high performance computing. And um, you know, the reason that they do that is often because they can't get it from the distros themselves. Um, and, or they want a newer version and the distro doesn't sort of keep up at, in that type of pace. And so what we see is for people who are at uh, supercomputing sites, that there's a lot of duplication up there. And so um, part of the motivation is to try to address this duplication as possible. Um, and when you think about it, there's an awful lot of you know internal kind of uh, tools that people create, right? Every every big supercomputing center tends to write their own tools to manage their system, um, and they often have a big staff that is uh, in charge of keeping up with their software. So, you know, that involves provisioning, uh, maintaining all the software installations, config management, um, and like I say, you know, there's a lot of duplication, but it's not exactly the same. So the functionality is similar, but to be honest, you know, it's not everybody is doing the exact same thing. So it makes it hard to have a uh, uh, you know, a common denominator. So, um, when we think about this as, as background, the question is, well, if we were to start a new community, can what could we do, right? What, what would you pick first? And I, at least the way that we have gone thus far is to focus on the least common denominator, which really is the software itself, right? Not focusing on how you, how you might provision a system, but focus on the software that you're going to put on the system. And so that's what we have done, focusing on the packaging of HPC software. And I'll show you uh, as we go along that you know we, we've adopted some conventions. You can argue whether you like them or not, but um, we've established some basic packaging guidelines. We do embed hierarchical support uh, for the software, and I think that's something that is very important to HPC. Probably people in the room hopefully will resonate with this, but you know it's very different than a typical distro type of install where you often only install one version of a compiler, right? That's not HPC. HPC is I have five versions of a compiler and many different families. And so you have to sort of address that in your architecture for any type of uh, community project. And we've done that, and I'll give you a little bit of an overview. So um, one thing to, to be very clear here, this is actually trying to provide binary, a binary distribution for certain packages. So um, in that sense, you might think of it as sort of a midstream type of uh, distro, if you will. Uh, so that there is an effort to provide binary so that people can you know, point their their repositories to OpenHPC and install things directly. That means you know, trying to leverage a lot of experience from the distro people, because I think the distro people do an incredibly good job of managing lots of different packages that maybe perhaps in HPC, when we do it ourselves, you know, we could argue whether we, we do a good job or not. So we are trying to learn a lot from the distro folks here. That means including dependency resolution. Um, now, I mentioned previously that you know, there is a lot of homegrown tools in HPC. And so purposefully right now, to start with, OpenHPC is not trying to be prescriptive on how you use these packages. And you know, so we're, we're not dictating a config management system. If you're a puppet shop or a CF engine shop or something like that, the intent is not to say that you should change. And you know, the reason for that, of course, is that people have a lot of experience and they tend to have very religious preferences almost. It's, it's kind of like uh, editors, and I noticed in a lightning talk before somebody mentioned Emacs. So I feel there's at least one Emacs user in, in the house, and uh, now there's two. I'm, I'm also an Emacs user. But we're not trying to be that prescriptive as to how, it, how you use the packages, but more in making them available. Uh, and we are trying to foster some community 
uh, interaction with giving example recipes for how you can install them, including a provisioner from bare metal. But, you know, at the end of the day, you're providing a repository, and they're just packages. So how you use them, to be honest, in some sense, is, is your business. Now, over, so this is kind of where we are at today with OpenHPC, and I'll show you the, the you know, give you an overview of, of the components that are included. But over time, we also want to go beyond just being an integration store. We want to uh, be a, a, a community that is also helping develop new content. So that means looking for interface points between different components and developing APIs and libraries between them. And so the example that I tend to use the most right now is um, you know there's a big push as we go forward when you think about managing a big HPC system. Right now, typically you think of installing compute nodes sort of as a mostly a, a one-time kind of thing, right? But uh, when we think going forward for a much more dynamic environment that is integrated with, uh, with the resource manager, we think of provisioning actually being something that happens associated with the job, right? And you can imagine that if you're going to switch out different provisioners, that that's a nice type of opportunity to sort of uh, abstract what provisioner you're using under the covers. So that's an example of what we're talking about here. So over time, we do want to explore that the uh, definition of interface points between a number of components. Okay, so in terms of the system architecture that uh, we're trying to support, it's the usual thing in HPC, right? So kind of on the left, you might say if you only have a few hundred nodes, it's a very simple type of infrastructure where you typically have one head node and it drives everything else. You put your resource manager on that, you, uh, you, know, you provision from this, and it's what we would typically think of as a being a flat architecture. But if you come from a big site, you're probably more used to something on the right-hand side where you delineate your HPC system into a number of different node groups. Uh, you might have I.O. servers, you might have login nodes, you might have a variety of management nodes. And so it's really, you know, these two extremes that we're trying to account for. Um, if you looked at OpenHPC today in terms of the provisioner that is included, the recipe that is there is a stateless recipe, meaning you, you install a, an image into a, a RAM disk and you pixel the node and every time you want to change something you re-pixel the node. I think stateless versus stateful is also a religious type of preference. Uh, you know, you're not really going to change depending on which camp you are. So there's definitely an effort in OpenHPC to provide this full uh, or stateful types of recipes as well. But, but as it stands right now, it is a stateless configuration. Uh, in terms of the community, I mentioned this started uh, very recently in November. We have a number of uh, folks who are participating in the community. Uh, it's actually being uh, housed under the Linux Foundation uh, out of the U.S. as a collaborative project. So we're actually still in the process of really formalizing the governance structure uh, of how it's going to work. But you can see there's you know, a reasonable amount of interest from OEMs and a number of end user sites and ISPs as well. So and, uh, if you're interested, I, I invite you to uh, uh, join and uh, be involved in the working group at the Linux Foundation. All right. In terms of what is actually in OpenHPC, when you think about building an HPC system, uh, I, I tend to say that everybody has a plot like this. It tends to look a little bit different, but it's the same idea over and over and over. And it's the concept that you need a lot of different functionality to really build and manage an HPC system, right? Starting with the kernel, of course, we only care about Linux uh, that dominates uh, HPC, so everything is Linux. But, you know, there are a lot of things that sit on top of Linux in terms of, uh, you know, fabric management, meaning interconnects, uh, provisioning, all the way over to things that the end user cares about, which is the software development tool chain. And a lot of times, I think when you see uh, tools that are out there in the community today, they tend to focus on one thing versus the other, right? There are sort of a lot of tools which will do just the, the bare metal provisioning, but then maybe not provide a huge amount of software development tools. Or it's the other way around, where they focus on the software development tools and um, not so much the management of the system. So we are trying, at least in OpenHPC, to address everything here, but you have to start somewhere. So I want to be honest, you know, we have picked a couple of, you know, one component from each of these, uh, but over time the intent is to provide multiple, multiple components in each of these areas. So as an example, for provisioning today, we use something out of the states called Werewolf, an open source project. Um, but certainly the intent going forward is to not only use that. We want to have multiple options. And that gets back to this idea of having uh, APIs that, uh, that, that are included to um, pr promote the use of different uh, provisioners. Here is a snapshot of, the, of what's in OpenHPC 1.0. Um, 
we are providing, I mentioned that we're providing binary builds, so it really is a repository. It's, a, you know, it's something that you would install your base OS, you would enable a repository, and then you would have access to all of these packages. Um, to start with, when we released it, CentOS 7.1 was out, so that's where the, uh, the builds are targeted at. Red Hat is reasonably, and, and CentOS is reasonably prevalent in the US from an HPC's perspective. So that's what we started off with. And we sort of group all the packages into different functional areas. So administrative tools, you know, provisioning, resource management. Um, so these are all the things that are there now. I do, I'm going to spend a little time talking about some of the hierarchies. So, you know, just pointing out here that we are trying to address the fact that people use different compilers, different MPI stacks uh, on HPC systems. So we have prepackaged those. And you might also say, well, why are you even bothering with something like GCC? That's something that you can get from the distro, right? But uh, to what is fairly prevalent, uh, I think, in HPC is you see a lot of sites want a newer version that comes from the distro, right? A lot of times, by the time something makes it into the distro, it's usually, you know, it could be a year, or if it's an MPI family, it might be two years old. So what we are trying to do here is include newer versions of components that are important to the community. And the convention is that if the version that's good enough the, the version that's in the distro is good enough, and there's no reason to repeat it. Do not. We only want to put things here that uh, the end consumer might want. So um, this is everything that we have today, and I'll show you on the next slide sort of uh, some new things that are coming. I do want to point out a couple of little things. So if you look at this, you might say, well, my favorite package isn't here. And certainly that is always going to be the case when you get into this sort of uh, scenario where you're providing binary builds. So we do want to provide the capability for people to help themselves, obviously. I mean, there's nothing preventing you 10 minutes left from, uh, thank you, um, adding on top of it. And you'll see, you know, inclusion of other packages which make this easier, like Easy Build is an example that, uh, uh, you know, people, if there's a package that's not part of OpenHPC, we, may, we include Easy Build so that they can, you know, very easily reference a bunch of other packages that might be part of the Easy Build uh, community and add them on top. All right, so this is a snapshot of uh, some future additions. Um, things like, uh, I mentioned this idea to have multiple provisioners, so today we have Werewolf, there's activity going on with XCAT, if you're familiar with that, which is another uh, provisioning and configuration management system. And I just show this, is if, you have, if you have suggestions for things you'd like to see here, you know, we're just maintaining a list that everybody's suggesting, please let me know and we'll add it to the list and try to get it out. Okay. So I mentioned this hierarchy business. I do want to say just a couple of things about that, which is, you know, in the HPC space, I think the end users are very, um, you know, used to the fact that they have lots of different tool chains available. And if you're a C++ guru, you might you say, I'm only going to use GCC and to hell with everything else, right? Um, or if you're a Fortran, and I realize there's relatively young crowd in here, but uh, you know, Fortran is still the most dominant programming language in high performance computing. And you know, it really causes a bit of a mess because you might say, why bother with a bunch of comp compiler tool chains because C today there's you know, ABI compatibility between all of the C compilers, which is, which is true, which is great. But there is not in Fortran. The instant you start using Fortran 90 modules, there is no ABI compatibility. And so what you tend to see a lot of sites do is they say, well, okay, to deal with it, we will just build our entire tool chain with all of the compiler families, and they just take on that ownership. And OpenHPC is doing the same thing, and that's, this slide is just trying to highlight this, meaning that we will have builds of a particular uh, component, like this is an example where you see HDF, which is a very popular I.O. library, and you see um, that we have a build for the GNU compilers and also for the Intel compilers. And then we have things which require MPI, where we build against three different MPI stacks as well, right? So at the end of the day, if you were to go look at the repository for something like Boost, uh, a popular C++ library, you would see, you know, three versions built for, for three different MPIs for GNU, and three versions built for Intel, right? And this, because of this um, hierarchy, it's something that really is embedded into the overall infrastructure of OpenHPC, and I'm going to show you that from top to bottom the build system also in the end user environment, <coughs> all right? And in terms of the end user environment, uh, we, you know, have adopted a, uh, um, a hierarchical system which takes a, which knows that you're gonna have multiple families and it embeds it into it. So this, you know, modules is something that has been around for 
more than 20 years, probably people are familiar with that. The version that we are using comes from Robert McClay, who's uh, in the audience, called LMOD, which is a new implementation, newer, I don't know, gosh, now it's... Nine years old, well... It's it can't be nine eight, years old. Eight years old. Oh my gosh. Here go. Okay, eight years old, um, which is a new version of modules that has some very nice um, features that you can take advantage of to sort of manage this hierarchy business. And I don't want to go into too much detail. The only thing I want to point out is that when you get into the business of um, deploying software on HPC systems, you have to sort of make the decision. You either have a flat approach where you just show everything to the user. You, you show them hundreds of packages and just let them fend for themselves, or you can adopt a hierarchical approach. And the way that OpenHPC is going is definitely to have a hierarchical approach, and it's embedded into the way that the module powers are, are created. And one of the very nice things about uh, LMOD is the fact that it can take care of this family hierarchy business for you. So the only thing I want to point out is, so imagine this is sort of a default OpenHPC install, um, and you, you see here that you have these modules loaded. You have an Intel compiler, an OpenMPI stack, and um, you have uh, Boost as well, right? So we, we see we have the Boost module loaded. Now when I echo an environment variable, it's going to point to the uh, Intel compiler and the OpenMPI version down here because that's what I have loaded. But if I want to change my environment, I can very easily just do that by swapping from one compiler tool chain to another. So that's what this is saying. I'm going to swap from Intel GNU. And LMOD under the covers takes care of all of this craziness for you, um, if you configure it correctly. And you will notice that now uh, when I switch, I, it automatically updates to have uh, the GNU compiler for me. So very nice. How much time do we have? Three minutes? Okay, thank you. So very quickly, I just want to point out some of the infrastructure that we're using. It's most of the standard stuff. Um, we have a GitHub site. We are using uh, the Open Build service, OBS, which is something that comes out of SUSE. It's what they use to release OpenSUSE. Um, it's a very nice build system for providing RPMs. It can build um, Debian packages. It can build RPMs. Um, it can build against different distros. And so that's what we're using to deliver all P RPMs. And at the end of the day, that's what we're delivering. And it really is a repository. We have a base repository and an update repository. You install, you'll install an OpenHPC release RPM. You'll get both of those. And you can just do the uninstall with the, the standard <coughs> kind of stuff. Um, for people who are old enough to remember LaTeX, we are using LaTeX for our documentation. Um, and that's uh, really um, on purpose here. Let me skip forward a little bit uh, on the documentation side. The reason that we are doing this is part of the community effort is to not just provide the packages, but we want to provide recipes for using the packages and standing up systems from bare metal which are validated, right? And sort of not just let you fin for yourself, but we would like to give you some, some example recipes that you can use to install a system and manage it from scratch. But that means you want to validate the documentation and often, you know, let's be honest, when we write code, we tend to do a great job on the code side. And maybe some of us skip a little bit of of uh, some steps on the documentation side, and I, I've sort of been guilty of this many, many times. So to, to try to address this issue, we are trying to include documentation from a validation point of view for, as a first-class citizen. And we actually, in our CI system, we use Jenkins, and we, we essentially take the documentation, we create scripts out of that, and we install systems from bare metal and run you know, a bunch of integration testing. And that's why we're using LaTeX, if you were to, you know, because it's typeset, we can do things like you see on the left-hand side, of, and I haven't told you this, but we're supporting multiple distros. So think about a scenario where you support SUSE and RHEL, right? You have two different package managers. You have Zipper and you have Yum. So when you think about documentation, that could be a pain in the rear to sort of say, well, sometimes I do Yum and sometimes I do Zipper. So that's why we're using LaTeX here, and we just extract all of that stuff in terms of making a, you know, a macro. So as opposed to saying Yum group install, we have group install. And depending on whether it's a CentOS build or a SLES build, you see on the right-hand side that it gets abstracted to the right thing. Um, in terms of installing the system, this is sort of the architecture that we assume. It's a classic HPC architecture. It is compute nodes. It is login nodes. It's a management node. There's an assumption that you have an Ethernet uh, back in and you have IPMI available so that you can make uh, power commands uh, and boot nodes. There are many things that you don't know in advance. It's very typical on an HPC system. You're not going to know the MAC addresses that you're installing from. So if you were to look at the documentation today, you would see that everything is sort of abstracted. There's lots of variables. You define these, and you have sort of total control over, over what your system looks like. Okay. Um, 
to say one word on integration testing. I mentioned that we try to take this very seriously. So we're not trying to replicate the integration work that comes from the components, right? With GCC, we assume those guys are experts. They have validated the compiler. What we're trying to validate is that we didn't screw up building it and integrating it and provisioning it on an HPC system. So we focus very much on this integration side of things. And we start from you know, root level types of tests all the way up to you know, third party and application types of tests. And I just want to mention this because if you go look at the GitHub site, in addition to seeing all the components and the spec files for how we build things, you'll see a test directory. And it's, you know, it's, a lot of effort has gone into this. You'll notice that every component that I mentioned has a corollary in terms of its test. And you know, when we are entertaining, you know, when people want to volunteer to put stuff in, sort of the reason for having this test harness is to make sure they understand, look, when you add your component, you're also, we, wanna, we want you to add a test as well. Um, and so this, right now, there's a, around 1,700 tests that happen from both the user level and root level environment, and we run this on InfiniBand today. And the expectation is that the community is gonna have its own infrastructure. Um, it's not just x86, by the way. ARM is interested, they've joined the community. So this really is intended to be multiple architectures uh, for HPC. And I will end with this. This is the information for uh, the community. There's, uh, here's our GitHub site. The build repo is right here. It's on build.openhpc.community. You can point your system to it today and start downloading packages. There's about 255 RPMs, um, and it's uh, several gigs in size. And we have a mailing list. Everything is here, and um, you know, invite you to, to enjoy the community and make suggestions and, and help us, and hopefully it's useful uh, going forward. And, and we do hope that it, it sort of takes off and becomes at least a, a centralizing point for a lot of common HPC packages. With that, I'll stop and take questions. Thank you. Any questions for Carl? No, so um, the provisioner that is in here happens to be a, uh, an image-based provisioner. And so what you end up doing is in a, on your management node, you have a Cheruta environment where you install all the RPMs that you want to be on that compute node. Then Werewolf takes that Cheruta environment and essentially creates a one file out of it, an image of it. And when you pixie, what you do is you send over a kernel, it boots into that, it, it, it tributes into that, and pulls over this image, and that's what gets put in RAM disk. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Hi, uh, John Holmes. Uh, oh, you're here. Yes. Yeah. Um, you said you about, may not after the talk. <laughs> you said about compiler choice. I mean, yeah. I, I'm familiar with a commercial HPC application called um, Star CCM. They actually ship a whole tarball full of different API implementations that right. touch the system one. That's right. And who, who here is familiar with OpenForm? Who's used OpenForm? Yeah. They ship with a specific version of GNU and you have to compile that before you install it. Right. You know, why? Why? I think actually, I mean, so I'm very familiar with that. You see a lot of people shipping MPI stacks. And, and to be honest, I think it's be not that OpenHPC, to be honest, is going to solve their problems. But I, reason, I think the reason they're doing that is because they don't know the environment that they're going to install into, right? Yeah. And over the years, in fact, I used to work for the people who did Star, uh, star CCO. Um, what you find is that it's just easier to control the entire environment than end up debugging a person's cluster, right? And so that's part of why hopefully something like OpenHPC can be useful if people sort of like buy into the conventions, right? We have to agree on the conventions. But if you knew, if you could say if, yes, that, fine. you know what, MPI yeah. is there and I know where it is and it's really working because of all of this integration testing, then maybe you would stop doing that nonsense. But we've got RPM dependencies. That's what you said. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So That's I, right. I need open HPC version such and such. I need GNU 4.7.1 or I won't work. That's right. <laughs> but that's where I think the distro people do a good job. I mean, really, you know, the package managers can solve this dependency problem if we if we really built in those dependencies. Yes. Which one? Arm. 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 Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, we don't have builds against Arm just yet, but Arm is part of the Linux Foundation um, project. And so I'm expecting over time, once we get hardware with ARM, that we will make builds available. But today, if you go download, you'll see the repository is just x86. Yes? One last question? 
to what extent do you regard this as something that's mainly going to be useful if sites sort of buy into the whole system as opposed to something that people think they can choose elements of? I'm, I, my personal opinion, the question is, how, you know, do you have to buy into the whole thing? My personal opinion is, is the reason to go this route to provide a repo is, is to allow people to cherry pick what they want, right? And I do think, actually, I think that's part of the issue in, in, in HPC is you see these, you see toolkits which sort of, they take ownership over everything, right? And you do have to buy into that system. And I think at the high end of HPC, in some sense, there's so much flexibility that is required by the end user that they tend to not like that approach. And that's why this is, you know, build a legitimate repository, manage the dependencies in a reasonable way. So if all you want is just one package and you're using your own config management system and you have your own provisioners, you're totally fine to do that. Uh, so I, I, I would like to say that it, the intent is that it supports both cameras. All right. Well, thank, thank you very much.